the summer of 1971, a gathering took place here at the Earthbridge Land Trust between the villages of Putney and Westminster, Vermont. The gathering brought together people from a wide range of backgrounds, but they all had one thing in common, and that was to grow food in a way to sustain the earth. This is the story of the organization that was born that day, NOFA, now called the Northeast Organic Farming Association, and of the people who nurtured the organic movement in our region. I'm proud to reminisce about the early years of NOFA when we were much, everything was much smaller and everybody was just starting out and most of us were pretty young then and there was no guidebook on how to even be an organic farm and how to build a business and and we were all finding old equipment and learning from each other and coming together and, and figuring out where to market stuff and what to do about bugs and what are these things eating the potatoes and, and from that it developed into a whole cooperative um, movement and most of that was due to Samuel and he was had all kinds of energy and he had a business sense and and a vision and um, yeah it all it, that all grew up that way you know and um, but I stayed true to you know being poor and farming <laughs> well I lived in a, I lived in a commune in uh, in in, uh, in Canaan New Hampshire we got together as a political collective at first but then it didn't take long to change into just trying to live together um, on the end of a dirt road uh, on a little time, a little piece of land um, and we had no running water, no telephone, no electricity, uh, a ratty old house that we fixed up and uh, we decided to, to grow our own food. And at some point, I don't exactly remember, but at some point, uh, word got out that we were going to organize, um, get together in Putney, Vermont, with this guy, Samuel Kanan, who was living in some kind of communal situation down there, who wanted to establish, I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to remember, it was Somehow we got the word that uh, we should come down to Putney. We we're going to have a big gathering, probably overnight, have bonfire, stuff, and talk about uh, talk about organic agriculture. And uh, so we went down, and uh, and there was I don't know I can't remember how many people there must have been probably a hundred people there anyway. And Samuel kind of Samuel came in with kind of the band that kind of got it all organized. And uh, I, at some point, I don't know whether he came up with a name, but at some point we came up with the name, the Natural Organic Farmers Association. It was pretty presumptuous because none of us at the point were really farmers. We were just a bunch of hippies that didn't, you know, were growing our own food. So that was kind of, that was how it began. And uh, that was the first, that meeting, it was, whenever it was, 71 or something, it was the first time that a group of people got together with the idea of creating some kind of organization which would be oriented, oriented towards organic growing, organic farming. So that was the beginning. In the, in the summer of 69, 70, um, I was on a hill top in New Hampshire, in New Hampshire, and I'd been given a field to live in and to make a garden in, right? Which was pretty astounding for somebody from New York, right? from Brooklyn. Okay? And uh, so we, we went to the library, uh, and I got out all the books I could find um, to find out how to make a garden. What, what is this stuff called soil? What, what's going on here? Because, you know, I, I, I thought food was assembled in the back of the grocery store in Brooklyn. Right? I didn't know it came from the earth. You know? It's a little embarrassing to say I was, I was an adult ready for children, but anyway. So I decided um, that I had to uh, pull together uh, 
uh, people who might help educate me. How do you make compost, right? I, was, I want to talk to somebody about mulching and why and how and, and the value of it. I want to talk to some, you know, I want to talk to people about pest management. I want to talk to people about all the aspects of, of uh, food, growing food. And so I, I, uh, I said, well, the best thing to do is create an organization. And I, I wrote out a, a flyer, I created a flyer, um, and it said, uh, uh, welcome to the first uh, founding meeting of the NOFA, right? And uh, I gave them a date and a place, and I gave them a list of uh, nine things that we would uh, found NOFA for that I thought, and then I, I left it open, of course, that whoever would come and join me could add or subtract or change it, you know, because I didn't want it to be my organization. I was just a facilitator of making it happen. And uh, on June 7th in 1971, a whole bunch of people came to Westminster on that sunny day on the slope, and we all sat around in a circle. So we had this meeting in Putney, and out of that, uh, I think probably Samuel was probably the impetus for this, but we decided we would try to meet uh, periodically to develop uh, whatever <laughs> that had to do with trying to grow organic food. We didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know what NOFA was. We didn't, you know, was it just a bulk order organization? Was it? Just a, an organization that, that made some standards. I mean, did you? Was there way of any way of enforcing the standards, or did anybody care? Or um, I know there were a couple of years there when we, we we gradually got more members. Mostly there were you know other com the communes at that, at that point were um, and the food and the food co-ops were 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 kind of a, a set of organizations. But we didn't know. I, I remember. I remember actually sitting in the meeting and saying, "What you know? What are we doing? <laughs> What's our purpose? What are we, are we? Are we just you know? And how can we get more members? We didn't. You know, we kind of reached the point where we had like fifty members or something. We had the newsletter, um, but we didn't. And, and some we didn't have a, a focus." field organizer at that point. Samuel came in as sort of a, our uh, spiritual leader and uh, philosophical uh, an analyst. But Robert really uh, took the, uh, the organizing model from uh, you know, SDS and such, uh, from, from the uh, 70s radical leaders and the anti-war movement, and translated it into uh, how we build up a uh, a farm positive, uh, nature positive, food positive organization. Uh, I was looking for a way uh, to get into uh, agriculture uh, on a hands-on basis. And it wasn't working out at the county I was living in. They didn't want to do that. They didn't, didn't want to get into commercial agriculture. Uh, and that's one reason why I left. But before I left, uh, I went down to the Barton Co-op for a meeting, uh, which was called to, uh, uh, by Samuel to organize support for NOFA. Again, working through the co-ops. That, that, those were the seed bed. That's where everything went out. And brown rice went out there, and meetings were held in the co-ops uh, all around Vermont, New Hampshire. So uh, that's where I met him, and uh, I was converted. Uh, uh, you know, by his vision, you know, I mean, he really had a vision of this whole thing. Uh, and so, uh, uh, I called him up and said, I want to come down and, uh, uh, be your soldier, you know? <laughs> uh, my first job, uh, was to fit into the project going on at the time, which is this wholesale down the Connecticut River marketing thing to, uh, uh, free schools and uh, community action uh, projects in New York City. The concept was to to pick up all pick up produce from all these growers and then deliver it 
to uh, the People's Warehouse in the Bowery in New York, as well as daycare centers. We would get into the Bowery late at night. I mean, we, by the time we got to Bowery, it would be like midnight. And we pull, we pull into the People's Warehouse, and there would be a hundred people waiting for us as, as this truck pulled in, and they would cheer. It was, it was like we had pulled off some kind of, uh, of guerrilla operation. But the concept was, uh, was uh, very political in nature in the sense that it was, it was to, to link urban co-ops, which were expanding very rapidly at this time. Um, with a growers, uh, a, a regional growers co-op based in, in, the, in the Connecticut Valley. And, and there is a lot of enthusiasm about this, uh, but there is a lot of difficulties. You know, there's, uh, there's technical difficulties, financial difficulties, and, and it, it became uh, so overbearing that we just had to make, make a change. And the one, the one thing uh, I'll take credit for was to coordinate this transition, transition from direct marketing, which we could have made a million bucks on, if <laughs> it sold out to, uh, <laughs> to Cargill, uh, or, or organizing locally. And uh, uh, I had for a long time been talking about farmers markets. And in fact, we went down to uh, Lancaster, I think, is, to visit a farmer's market. And, and uh, so uh, the emphasis would be uh, sort of farmer's markets were a vehicle for cooperative activity. It was a springboard. That was my and Samuel's uh, and others, but not a majority of others, feeling that these should be uh, Seedbeds for cooperative action, beginning with marketing, and then it would branch out to be local cooperatives in, in a in a statewide system. We had published a manual. I got a grant. Krugman, uh, he was in uh, Plainfield. He did, uh, with my help, others. He did a, a farmer market manual, which sold uh, throughout the country. Uh, that's how other farmers markets picked it up because it was the only manual out there for uh, how to begin to organize a farmers market. Yeah. So Robert and I got to know each other and um, one day he stopped by and said, well, um, we just got a grant to organize some farmers markets and uh, how would you like to organize one in in Newport. I helped co-found the Brattleboro Farmers Market, which was, I think, the second or third farmers market established in Vermont. And back then, it was a, a lot, there was a lot of um, opposition uh, in town to this whole concept of like, what kind of people are going to come to a farmers market? You know, they didn't know if it was like a tag sale and, you know, a bunch of hippies and you know, they're worried it was going to detract from the town and the type of pe the, the arguments were crazy. Um, but there was opposition from local storekeepers who didn't think it was fair. We're not, we don't pay taxes and, you know, blah, 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 and this and that. But the crowds we drew, um, the other shopkeepers started like selling, hanging out on the periphery, trying to catch some of our overflow to sell their products, it was kind of interesting. And now, of course, every town wants a farmer's market because it's such a draw. And we became really part of the fabric of life in Brattleboro. And you know you made it when the real estate agents like bring potential home buyers to the market. And this could be your farmer's market. And people get all excited, you know, that, uh, wow. So we felt more and more like a Vermont community of NOFA all over the state, which, which was very exciting. And what, what, what was amazing for me in my time at NOFA was the incredible volunteer spirit, a robust volunteer spirit in NOFA. And also people, people had idealism. We really felt then that somehow we really could turn things around. This grassroots movement could change to a local, sustainable, Ag of economy, small face-to-face -face community, 
with agriculture, small farms, small diversified farms, small organic farms as the foundation of that. Well, how wonderfully crazy we were to think that we could be doing this. <laughs> That we were setting out an alternative despite all the evidence that said, you know, that's not going to happen. We did it anyway. Mm -hmm. And we're all a little bit odd because of that. Maybe over emphatic because we had to argue very hard. I think there are younger people who can be cooler about it. But we had to um, put up with a lot of teasing learn to be gracious to people who had been incredibly insulting to us um, when they came around to, to realize that, well, maybe they did have something, you know, to say. Uh, so I went to the library, I read all these books, and uh, well, all the books were like from before 1960, every book uh, that I found. Well, one of the books was the inspiration for my life from then on. It was like a, I was like born again at that moment from that book. And the born again related to my focus on agriculture and the soil. And it's, I think it's important to name the book and tell you what it was and why, because it's uh, essential. Because it's, it's behind NOVA. Really. It's the basis of NOVA, this book. And, and my relationship to the earth came from this book directly. The name of the book is Soil and Civilization right? uh, by, and the author is Edward Hyams, H-Y-A-M-S, Hyams. And this book gives an overview of all of the history of humankind, all of the recorded history of humankind, and even some of the archaeological history of humankind. And taking a look at the relationship uh, uh, between the soil and agriculture and the demise of every one of these past civilizations. Okay? And basically the reason for the collapse of every one of these civilizations was the degradation of, of the soil and the, and the degradation and demise of local agriculture. We went back to a lot of the older books, textbooks, um, because people did farm before chemicals, and so there were there was wisdom from um, the, the 20s, 30s um, that we could tap into. We also subscribed to Acres. I wrote a lot at that point for articles for Acres. I, I got the uh, the New Farm magazine was interesting. Uh, Albert Howard, I read some Albert Howard. Uh, read Farmers of 40 Centuries. Uh, one Straw Revolution, kind of a lot of that stuff that, you know, and, and a lot of it was just reinforcing what I was doing. I started reading Sir Albert Howard, um, um, Lady Balfour, I learned about the Soil Association. Total hunger for any kinds of information. Rodale, organic gardening, you got to just put them at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. Wendell Berry. Um, mm -hmm. Helen and Scott Nearing. Sure. And these are all people that just devour their stuff. And my grandmother had a subscription to Organic Gardening magazine, and I read every issue cover to cover. William Albrecht wrote, study books and observe nature. And when the two disagree, toss the books. Horace Bascom uh, was a dairy farmer who lived in Langdon, uh, New Hampshire, and uh, was very sympathetic to organic and really already, he was like a person who had read all those books from the 50s and the 40s, right, and knew about it. And I was, it was meeting him that I met the first like person who actually was doing it, trying to do his best. And he, 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 he didn't have organic grain, you know, but he really avoided, you know, using chemicals on his farm. He was like, uh, sort of like a mentor for me as a, as, a, as a person who I really looked up to and learned a lot from because his uh, commitment was so deep. You know, like he, he had a spiritual connection to the earth that was powerful. So, so there, were these, there were these different, there were different 
groups of people doing different things. There were the old school, like the Nearings, Back to the Landers from the 30s. And then there were all of us hippies <laughs> who were uh, suddenly found, uh, found ourselves very interested in trying to eat good food. And, uh, you know, it all came out of the anti-war movement. I mean, that was a lot of it, that, that you know, we, you know, we, the, the anti-war movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement was, for many of us, but certainly for me, was the, the time when I realized that my society and my government was not without flaws, and some of the flaws were serious. And Vietnam War was the really focus that, um, you know, we, we began to doubt. I mean, I grew up in the 50s, you know, I was like, you know, pretty straight kid growing up in the in the 50s, and, and this was, uh, you know, it was kind of a shock. The, the Vietnam War has really uh, um, brought things into a different focus. And anyway, but but what followed from that, you know, once you once you sow the seed of doubt about the culture and the, the political system and the society you live in, all of a sudden, you know, you 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 vote, you have a lens into a whole lot, a whole world that is has some contra has contradictions. From the politics, you know, some you know some radical politics, all the way to the to the to music and cultural issues, and you know, back to the land and all. I mean, these were all ways of, of questioning the status quo. I have just come from living ten years outside of the United States. I had been living in Asia and also in Europe. And during those years, which was a decade, I saw a dark shadow that was coming over the land. It, and I was trying to understand what is this? And it, it, it was something that was creeping over Asia at that time in the, in the 70s, in the early 70s, 1970s. And <clears throat> going over Europe, which was the deterioration of rural life and small farms, happening everywhere. And it was, of course, about the colonialization of big corporations, which now we call globalization, and we didn't necessarily have a name for it. But it prompted E.F. Schumacher to say, to write about small is beautiful, rather than big is better. And so in Europe, there was an exciting counter movement to this. Young people were going back to the land. It was parallel to the United States, period, in, in the 70s. So young people were going back to the land. And in, in Europe, there was a cultural movement because they were going back to their traditional culture. I wanted to be a part of this movement. Well, I was uh, an anti war activist and involved in environmental issues. It just absolutely didn't occur to me to go to a farm where they were using chemicals. That was just not mm -hmm. in my worldview at all. I was looking for a way of living out the values of having a cleaner environment and working for peace. And I saw organic as a peaceful kind of activity, making peace between human beings and our environment. You know, I'd, I'd gone through extension. It was, you know, um, you know, plant the corn, spray the atrazine, um, and, and put on a fungicide. And, and so it was all chemical, what I had learned, you know, in my, my early days. Around 1975, 1976, I started um, uh, seeing things that I felt were wrong with the land. The dust would blow around. We didn't seem to have organic matter. We hadn't put any manure on it for at least 10 or 12 years. Uh, we were renting quite a bit of the land to a local dairy farmer. Um, I was seeing weeds, nutgrass you couldn't kill, no matter how much herbicide you put on it. Uh, there were no worms in the ground. As a kid, I could walk behind the plow and, and pick up worms to go fishing. There weren't any worms. So it really something clicked in my mind that you know, something's wrong. We're still animals, last I checked. And uh, we're utterly dependent upon nature, just like all the rest of nature. We need, you know, the organisms need each other. 
people from their own experiences have uh, discovered that uh, maybe pesticides are bad for them too. My grandmother never used chemicals, for one thing, and neither did my mother. And they had an outright position against it. That seven kills the bees. We had the advantage, I had the advantage that my parents were European peasant farmers and that there was always a suspicion of chemicals. I could remember back what things were like before and we saw some of the changes fast enough that we noticed that our soil was changing, that our weeds were changing, that other things on the farm were changing when we, after we used chemicals. Well, when we learned to farm organically, we had to unlearn a lot of things that I had learned. And what we had to unlearn was the idea that everything is random and that farming is a series of reacting to random events. And we realized that there was nothing random about the agronomic problems. They were the result of our agronomic practices. And when we changed the agronomic practices, then the problems changed. In fact, I, I won't say they went away because every farmer always deals with problems. But we certainly could trace our, our agronomic issues back to things that we had done in our management. And that's a real, that's turning the world upside down. We, we were a conventional dairy farm in the strongest sense of the word. My father used chemicals and fertilizers and everything he could get his hands on to try to increase production of the cows and the, the cropland. And by 1979, when I graduated college, the wheels were starting to come off, so to speak. We, uh, we were having cows that we could not keep healthy. We couldn't maintain cow numbers. We couldn't grow crops. Um, and I, it was actually the first time I actually started getting really involved in the farm, and looking at books and things like that, you know, trying to figure out what was wrong um, because it just wasn't working. So in 79, we had to buy 20 red heifers to maintain our herd size. And we had a family gathering that summer in August, and I told my grandmother that I had gone to Federal Land Bank and gotten money to buy 20 red heifers. And they said, if I need any more, be sure to let them know. And I expected a little pat on the back from her. Instead, she looked at me kind of sternly and said, well, all I know, when your grandfather and I were on this farm, we had red heifers to sell every year. Sure helped our bottom line. Well, I stuck my tail between my legs and started doing some thinking. And that winter, um, realized that, you know, this $25,000 a year back then, 1980, 79, 80, that we were spending on chemicals and fertilizer had to be directly related to the thousand dollars a month we were spending on vet pills and that we were still unsuccessful keeping cows alive and bred back and healthy. So we started in 1980 with experimenting with uh, farming without chemicals and herbicides and of course everybody said you're going to fail. There's no way you can do it. And by 84, we decided we should get certified because we wanted to try to bottle our own milk and sell it as certified organic. But we never were able to make that happen financially, but our herd gradually got healthier instead of having the vet come every week routinely to try to treat cows and, and infuse them with um, things to try to get them to clean after they've had a calf and get them to settle and treat mastitis and drink feet. We went to every other week, then we eventually went to once a month, and by 1987, we were on an as-call basis, and by the early 90s, the only time we had a vet on the farm was to dehorn cat. So I went to URI, um, studied agronomy, thought I'd be a land, uh, golf course superintendent, like my father was. Uh, but decided to become a landscaper, had a landscaping business, bought this piece of property that was a, just trees back then. And I quickly became disillusioned with using 
chemical intensive agriculture. That's what I study. Um, and I was using that in my landscaping business, and I was witnessing the harm that was doing to soil life. Uh, there was a lot of thatch on the lawns, and the thatch was being caused, it's a man made problem, the excessive thatch was being caused by the overuse of chemical fertilizer and chemical pesticides disturbing the soil life. So as I witnessed that, at the same time, we, we just, my wife and I were just having a young family. I wanted to, for them to eat healthy food. We were learning about organic food. And I was kind of a walking contradiction. Here I am trying to uh, nourish my family with organic food, and yeah, I'm running a landscaping business that's heavily involved with uh, chemicals. Uh, so by witnessing the harm the chemicals were doing to the soil, I started reading Rodell Organic Gardening. Uh, I started reading biodynamics, the Steiner biodynamic literature, and uh, stuff about the founding fathers, so, sort of before my generation that wrote about organic agriculture, and it made more sense to me. It made more sense because the solutions I had through uh, the chemical approach, I could see the harm it was doing to the soil. I think when I started coming to NOFA conferences, I just found lots of people who had similar interests. In NOFA, I found a, a community of people who were felt the same, you know, who weren't looking for the fancy cars and the big houses and didn't have television and all that kind of thing. It just had a different, different approach and, and found the real richness in nature and in working with nature in, in a cooperative uh, mutual and beneficial way. We became part of the NOFA community simply because it was fun. You know, we'd go to the NOFA <laughs> New York conferences down at TC3 um, because it was just such a hoot. Uh, <laughs> and, you know. Anyway, Robert Hurrier called me and he said, uh, this natural farmer that you're putting out, because then by then I was doing it all the time, 100%. He said, it, he, he liked the intent. He said, but the writing is terrible, the graphics is terrible, the organization of it is terrible, and it's very amateurish, and I would like to take it over. So I said, Robert, you got a deal. <laughs> he was great. I mean, he, he was so excited about it, right? And uh, it got a thousand percent better, because, <laughs> you know, he really knew what he was doing. He wasn't so amateurish. And he's a great writer, and, and uh, he really is a good writer. And we mimeographed these sheets, and it was called The Natural Farmer. Jack Cook took over The Natural Farmer and really turned it into a nice publication. I mean, Robert had been putting out these mimeographed newsletters. That was what was happening at the time. And then at the end of 87, the summer conference, the uh, Interstate Council met again and said, well, congratulations, you guys are doing a great job promoting the summer conference and the summer conference getting members and, you know, building the organization and people subscribing to the National Farmer, you know, volunteered at that point to uh, take it over and put together a business model. I, I loved it because it was a wonderful opportunity to get involved in things that I thought were important, be they you know, issues of uh, urban farming or, or uh, how to grow garlic or, or uh, you know, GMOs. So I asked the Biodynamic Association if they would co-sponsor a conference, right, that I would create. And they agreed to it, right? As a matter of fact, they agreed to put up the money, too, by the way, because NOFA had no money. They even found a place for me in Wilton. New Hampshire. I did go to the first conference in 1975, I believe it was High Mowing School. Mm -hmm. Lundell Berry was the keynote speaker. I remember, I think it was Samuel Kamen's workshop on soil, soil health and soil organisms and what was going on in the soil. It just completely fascinated me. We had 350 people, which we thought was pretty good. They said, well, let's next year let the Vermont people take responsibility and, and the following year, New Hampshire people to try to make it go back and forth from Vermont and New Hampshire. And by then, the Biodynamic Association said, okay, let it be the NOFA conference. So then I started going to those conferences and that was it. That's where the information was. It was peer learning. You couldn't beat that. It had all the juice 
um, from people who were also going through the same stuff you were. We had gone to the 1985 and 1986 summer conferences and enjoyed ourselves heartily and found out at the 1986 conference that which was at Johnson State that they were maybe going to cancel the conferences altogether because I think for three years in a row, 84, 85, 86, they had lost money and it was bouncing back and forth between Northern New Hampshire and North Vermont. And um, there was a, a request of the council, the interstate council, to help with the debt. And many of the, um, the other chapters, particularly in New York at that point, was just like, we're not interested at all in, in helping pay off this debt that was kind of accrued, incurred, I should say, by um, those two chapters, North New Hampshire and Vermont. So uh, Jack and I, I remember, well, we kind of gathered a group of, of Massachusetts folks who were at that conference in 86 and said, would you all like to help us put on a, a conference? We had heard of conferences back in the 70s, you know, bringing in 1,500 people. And I think that they were getting way, the numbers were coming, way, waning a lot in the mid-80s. Mid and so we were able to get 800 people out the first year we did at Williams College. And then we were able to get a thousand people out after that the next year. And I think soon after that, we were up to like 1200 and it kept it there, 12 to 1400, pretty much under our, our tenure um, of 24 years of running the conference. One of the summer conferences, I think it was the 79 summer conference, you went away, farmers were saying, hey, you can't come in the summer. It was a bad sign for a conference. And so it was obvious. Well, then we'll have a winter conference. It started off with the um, soil seminar in 1980, and I think it was March. And uh, so that was, and we had Samuel team in there, wonderful um, attendance, people very excited to come and learn in depth about soil science. And then the next year, we created a summer, a winter conference, an actual conference with a whole day. We rented a church basement. People flooded into the church basement. You know, I just loved going to the conferences. You know, you'd go, they were in March, um, and, you know, here you were kind of just, maybe you'd ordered your seeds, maybe you'd started something indoors, and to see slideshows of this is how I grow carrots, and this is how I grow lettuce, and it's just like the infusion of green energy and enthusiasm. It was just fabulous. I learned so much from the conferences. Now, one of the things we, we focused on was education, and Al Johnson had this wonderful plan to start workshops on the farms. And of course, all these years, uh, farmers in Milka had been learning on the ground, and now they were ready to teach. And were very excited to be asked to do workshops on their farm. And of course, back in those days, without any internet, of course, we couldn't do pre-registration. So our first workshop on a rainy October, no, rainy April, April day, 60 people showed up on this farm. We were so surprised. And it went on like that. It was very exciting um, workshops and community gatherings um, on the farms and people learning. New Hampshire actually ran the first on-farm workshops it was organized by Lowell Reinheimer, who at the time was a vegetable grower, became a dairy farmer later on, and then went to work for Organic Valley, and I haven't heard from him for 20 years. The um, on-farm workshop uh, system has been fabulous. NOFA has, has, has sponsored NOFA. Uh, just getting together and talking shop, which is one of our farmers' favorite things to do. In the 60s, Dairy farmers, the small hill farms were going out of were banded. They're going out of business. And so that was how a lot of the people from NOFA could buy farmland because it was so cheap then. But in the 1980s, everything was changed. 1980s was the Reagan era. Funding was drying up for nonprofit organizations. And the old idea of agriculture bigger is better. So in the night and also what's happening in the nineteen eighties was development coming in and taking the farmland because they were saying, Oh, farming is out, it's a dead industry. We can just put shopping malls and, and uh industrial parks and housing developments on the land. So that was where we 
we put in a wedge, as Vermont knows us. We went to a lot of hearings. We we advocated for preservation of farmland. We got farmers to come to the legislature, which is it's grassroots organizing. And grassroots organizing is a perfect thing for NOFA to be doing. Then you started realizing where the food was coming from and realizing why the food we wanted to go out wasn't getting there mm -hmm. um, just because of the cheap food policy mm -hmm. doing that. And so things started to come together for me for policy with my poli sci background and farming. But at the same time, I think the Alliance for Food and Farming is the big agribusiness group out there. They just put out this whole thing on be careful when you go to the farmer's market. You don't know about food safety with those small scale farmers. And, you know, sowing gout is mm -hmm. their stock in trade. And we're really having a major effect. And mm -hmm. so um, we're getting a lot more resistance at the same time. And, you know, um, but I'm talking from the policy side and I have to keep everybody awake to all these things that are going on. Mm -hmm. When we go to Capitol Hill, you can say I'm from NOFA. You know, we have 6,000 members and we have seven state organizations. By the way, we have 53 representatives in the House of Representatives and 14 senators. And we're getting better at being in touch with these people. <laughs> and this is what we need and what we want you to understand. <laughs> NOFA was founded, and up until that time, it was a bi-state organization, one organization that was both New Hampshire and Vermont. There was a lot of sort of tension, rivalry between the two states. They, you know, we, we just talked about uh, how to divide, but still be affiliated and still collaborate on things that were of regional concern. and. So I thought, well, you know, let's set up a system so that we can bring in more state chapters. And so we sat down and hammered out a a, a plan, and and so that both states would contribute to the natural farmer, which would cover both states. And we finally had an agreement, and it it all worked out. I guess it, I think it worked out quite well. And that was the beginning of the NOFA Council. And wasn't long after that that we got Massachusetts on board and Connecticut on board. We already had members in both of those states. And, you know, eventually New York, New Jersey, Rhode Island. So started Connecticut NOFA as a way to save energy, you know, local food, um, not using chemical fertilizer. I worked, um, you know, we're trying to convince UConn to, to limit their nitrogen recommendations, which I think they did at the time. A friend of mine, David Yarrow, had been quite an activist in the community and in 1982 um, wanted to create the New York State chapter. And uh, I'm an artist by trade and it asked me as a friend to make a poster. So I made the original poster for this little gathering in the church. It wasn't a church basement, but it's the equivalent of a church basement. No fun. Massachusetts started our chapter the year that I was 40. I said that I was old enough at 40 to be the president of something, so I agreed to be the president of NOFA in Massachusetts. We created the organization in part because we already had a committee of farmers who were learning together to do organic agriculture, and we met once a month and we did readings and studied and made presentations to one another. And we felt we needed an organization that could carry a certification program, so it was good to have a NOFA chapter. I wanted to become a certified organic farm, um, and I went to Massachusetts to apply to Mass because we had no certified certification process in Rhode Island. And the people up at Mass, Jackson, uh, Kittrich, and others recommended that we form our own NOFA. I found like-minded people in this area and we uh, started NOFA. So when I got to New Jersey, um, I really didn't 
to know anyone else. I knew a couple of people through the Watershed Association that was my employer um, who were interested in this sort of thing, but I didn't really have any way to connect with other people who were interested in organic growing or who had organic farms. And that was what compelled me to, to call for that first meeting. I, I was planning to go, I arrived at the farm in May and the, the first, the NOFA conference was in New Hampshire was in August. And by then I'd figure out, wow, I really need to try to find other people. And the NOFA conference seemed like a great place to do that. So I called for a meeting of people New Jerseyites who attended the NOFA conference uh, to get together uh, on the Sunday morning before we all left the conference. And that's where I got to meet everyone who became the core of the of New Jersey NOFA. Yeah, I think the early NOFA movement is very much was a consumer-led uh, movement. And, um, and I think very smartly so, the New England NOFAs could see early on that there was more power in, in working together. So I was on an interstate council uh, with a lot of the top people in the Massachusetts and uh, New Hampshire and Vermont, and we would get together up there in uh, Springfield, Mass, and every uh, few months we kind of kind of get together and say, well, what what kind of what agendas can we work together to help each other out? I think it was 1990 that we decided to do an organic landscaping as the theme of our winter conference. And we did that and it was phenomenally successful. Lots of people came. I was working, working as a landscaper and started to integrate organic farming methods and materials into my landscaping business. And that led to be Besides the start of Rhode Island NOFA, it led to the beginnings of the Organic uh, Land Care uh, Association. So then uh, sometime in the late 1990s, 99 maybe, um, a group of people got together through the two states, from Massachusetts and, and Connecticut mostly, to begin this organic land care program, which then had a, the first thing they did was write some standards which were the first in, in the country, the first maybe in the world, for organic land care, which were published, I think, in 2001 for the first time, and then developed a course to address, teach those standards to the land care professional. We were really, um, you know, we were, we were babes in the woods, literally. We didn't know anything. We didn't know where to get things. We didn't know how to do anything. And one of the things that we first started doing with NOFA was trying to come up with some standards. I mean, you, you know, you tell somebody, well, we have organic, we're growing organic vegetables and we're, you know, trying to eat organic food. But what, what's that? What is organic food? I mean, it, there was no, there was no idea really for most people what that even meant. So we had to give it a meaning or have some definition. So uh, several of us started working on, on standards. Um, you know, so if you wanted to be a member of NOFA and you wanted to, you wanted to grow things organically, then what did you have to do to sort of meet that requirement? And you needed some standards. So we tried to develop some standards and I did a lot of that myself. And basically what I did is I read through the, the, the uh, Encyclopedia of Organic Gardening and found what they said was, they thought was organic and I made a list and uh, started putting this thing together. Yeah, there was no roadmap at all. And I remember when the first rumors of, um, oh, what do we, you know, we're organic, but how do we know? And how do we, you know, people, there already was faux organic showing up. Uh, and how do we differentiate between the people who just making signs at the farmer's market saying organic, but they, we knew they weren't. So the certification thing started to happen, and um, I became, I think, the first one, the first guinea pig in 1978. And... Um, the requirements back then were not nearly as complex as now. 
In fact, I don't recall any paperwork. <laughs> I mean, somebody showed up with a pad and, you know, I answered questions and, and that was about it. And I remember back then, you know, if you go to the produce market or a store and you say, oh, I got organic, you know, potatoes, they look at you and go, why? You know, what am I supposed to do with that? Nobody wanted it. And, and it, so most of the time, our stuff was sold as conventional stuff. And I think that was the case with most of my compatriots at the time throughout Vermont. I guess it was probably seven, early 77 when the, the NOFA certification committee or the standards committee, I don't remember what they called themselves, but um, they put out a call for somebody to set up a certification program as a volunteer or for like a couple of hundred dollars or something like that. And, and uh, I think I was the only one who, who volunteered. So I got the job. <laughs> and we were able to get some funding from um, the FISMIT program through the State Department of Agriculture in Massachusetts that paid for hiring Lee Stivers to help us complete our set of standards. And so we published the NOFA mass um, organic standards. And the process in putting those standards together um, was a very participatory one where we had meetings all around the state. I believe we had five or six different meetings in different parts of the state where farmers and the customers of those farmers, the consumers who were eating the organic food, worked out together what we could do. There were many of the consumers who wanted no, um, none of the botanicals, nothing toxic. They wanted no chemical residues. And we had to say to them, we need a few little things, you know, we have these pests and if you want to have something to eat, we have to be able to have some tools mm -hmm. of this kind, even though we recognize that when we're better farmers, we may not need them, but we're not there yet. And then in 1988, in 1988, the green markets in New York said, if you're going to sell organic, you're going to put down on your sign, you have to be certified. So suddenly we had all these mem farmers that were and were not members coming together and saying, we need a certification program. NOFA had started their own certification program in 1989 with uh, Michael Baraka as their inspector. And I think they realized that uh, because we have a lot of small farms and also just gardeners wanting to be certified at that time, for the amount of time it was taking to run the program, they really couldn't uh, do it for free or at an affordable rate. So they asked, the state to take it over. And in the early 80s, when we decided to get certified, I, I at one of the NOBS meetings said I want to get be certified organic. And um, Pat Kane at the time said, well, okay, but we don't have any standards. You want to tell us what you're doing? And uh, we'll go and we'll look it over. So we wrote down all of our practices, what we did for cow care, health care, for growing crops, rotations, what we applied to the soil and all that. And basically, she was no from New York at the time, and um, looked everything over, came down, looked the farm over, and said, "Okay, you're certified." And there was actually a group of people called the Northeast Interstate Organic C Certification Committee that had regular meetings in Belchertown, Massachusetts, that included uh, Mafka from Maine and the other. NOFA chapters, and we met regularly to discuss developing the standards. Small nuances in the standards could trip people up, and the process of how you make decisions had to be very transparent, um, and there had to be some some way to guard against conflict of interest and all of these things that never really were on our radar in the early years. And some people see the National Organic Program as our sellout. 
Mm -hmm. I see it as our toe in the door of the uh, Department of Agribusiness. Mm -hmm. And it keeps that door a little bit open for the day when we'll turn it into the Department of Resilient and Sustainable Regenerative Organic Agriculture. <laughs> but when you've got your toe in the door, it's going to get squeezed. I probably inspected for seven or eight certifiers. And I had to read seven or eight certification standards, many of 90 something percent of which is all the same. But there were, was 5% difference. Uh, to me, it was a relief to see the, the, or the national standards come into effect because then everybody was the same. And you didn't have the, the uh, situation where somebody said, well, because we require this and you don't require this, ours are better, so we won't accept your standards. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a mess. Uh, I come to it from a from, uh, personal point of view. I, I was happy to see, I, and I still am happy to see, the USDA owning the word organic. I sold at a farmer's market in Rutland, Vermont, uh, and the guy next to us would tell people, he didn't have a sign up, but he had this, you know, this big green van, and he had a table, and he said, oh, I'm organic. And so we talked to him. I said, yeah, I'm organic. I just spray, spray a little bit of seven on my cabbages. Uh, that was what he, you know, beautiful cabbages. Um, so I said, okay, but you know, I, I, he could tell people what he wanted. There wasn't any regulation on it. We're in a very, very dangerous moment in human history. If we do not win this fight to reduce the carbon in the air, life is going to be hell. All that good stuff that Bill McKibben and all the other people are doing to reduce emissions is good stuff, but we really need to start, you know, stabilizing the, the land we grow on. And it made sense to me that it was just a responsibility for us to take that on. We asked Jack to do an issue on it. On um, you did it by that fall. I think you did your first issue. Twenty fourteen, I think, yeah. was your first yeah. issue. Yeah. And then um, we had him do a white paper, which. Um, was you know became very um it got picked up all over the world actually um, on soil carbon and then you know somewhere along the line then a lot of people were talking about it myself and a bunch of other vermont farmers we went to the nosb uh hearings in jacksonville florida i think it's been three years now where they were going to do the final ruling on whether or not hydroponic produce could be labeled as organic. They gave it a temporary label then, and they were allowed to do it up until, but they were going to do a final ruling. And we went down and testified, and I testified in front of this, this board, and um, as to my feelings of hydroponics being uh, certified organic and as I said there and I and I say now I'm not anti-hydroponic I'm pro dirt all right we're pro soil and 99.9% .9 of consumers assume when they buy a carrot that's labeled organic that it's grown in some farmer's field and when they buy a pint of strawberries that it's grown in some farmer's field and picked by hand and it had something to do with soil and the people who grow it are doing right by the soil and thereby doing right to the planet. That's what they believe. So by, by certifying hydroponic, which is, you know, growing in liquid, you know, a solution, and, and you can't spell, well, but it's all natural floating, you know, fertilizers in that solution. But it's not what people think they're buying. So, you know, you're, you're, mis, you're hoodwinking them. And so we came up with, you know, after the hearing, and they ruled that night that they, yes, hydroponics can be certified organic. And we knew the fix was in, and there was huge money behind getting, having that happen. And we, somebody came up with the real organic as an add-on label to help differentiate uh, the organic label that's not only organic, but it's certified organic but it's real organic and it's a farmer driven movement. So farmers certify each other and visit and we're dealing with, you know, real farmers and uh, real farm families all across America. So it's just like a, a quality assurance. 
and so that people are getting what they think they're getting when they buy organic. Um, and although most organic farms are real organic, it really is the intrusion of this hydroponic thing that we feel, uh, and the economics are really different than soil grown uh, produce. So that's, that's my involvement in the real organic movement. And obviously my heart is with uh, NOFA because that's where I, I started. I was just reading the nod to the Northeast Organic Dairy Producers Association newsletter. And there's a little chart in there that shows the numbers of organic dairy farms in the Northeast states since 2010. And in the aggregate, the number has gone down by 73. So even among organic dairy farms, there continues to be a loss and some consolidation of farms getting bigger than other farms going out of business because we're not paying enough to cover the cost of production. The big problem that's emerging is corporate agriculture treating organic farming just like another commodity. Because while organic farming depends on diversity, conventional agriculture depends on monoculture. Our farm programs, our political system, is actually subsidizing monoculture. Our crop insurance rewards monoculture and penalizes diversity. Now we've suddenly discovered cover crops, but I think the cover crops is just what we learned in the vegetables before. These systems weren't diverse enough to be sustainable. And we've got to do something to bring our soil health back, or we will have destroyed the means of production while getting great yields. There's an interesting factoid, and that's every pound of corn that's grown in the corn belt is destroying, two, is actually causing erosion of a pound of topsoil. That is not a sustainable system. Keeping the issue in people's minds, reminding everybody that internationally, fairness is one of the basic principles of organic agriculture. It's not just a method of production and a marketing tool. Um, it's a way of life. It's a holistic philosophy. And it includes being fair to the farmers and fair to all of the people who work in that agriculture. So the Agricultural Justice Project you know, has that as our standards. Basic standards are working off, you know, how do we make it fair? And there are farms that despite working in this um, cheap food economy, that's more and more agglomerated and consolidated in the hands of bigger and bigger corporations. It is still possible for tremendously creative and committed people to make farms and food businesses where all the employees are treated with respect, paid living wages, and which trade fairly with other businesses. What I'm seeing is, you know, we're 12 miles from Syracuse. I'm seeing the real growing food, energy, cooperative stuff happening in the city. Big urban gardens happening, big claiming old lots and regenerating them and really involving a lot of young people in the city. And a lot of people a little younger than me, maybe 20 years younger, 30 years younger, that are opting to be part of an urban renewal in a, in a green way, as opposed to moving out to the country. Our middle son and our youngest son have actually, since 2010, taken over the management of the farm. They actually own all the cows, all the equipment. They're making all the decisions on everything. And once in a while, they, they ask the old guy here <laughs> for advice. But um, they're doing a really, really good job with what they're doing. Um, we're really proud of them. Grew up here, um, born and raised, and um, but just five years ago, officially took over as the manager um, and now the owner of the farm. And but uh, just always part of it, and always part of NOFA. Um, as a little kid, growing up um, at the foot 
the, literally the feet of the people running the meetings, <laughs> Mike and Polly and Poppy and uh, so many good people there, um, just playing on the ground with overhearing talk about organic food and farming. And then in the summers, going to the NOFA summer conferences and the children's program there. I have just an awesome memory of uh, being at the children's program there and making tie-dye shirts and being excited making one for my dad and he was about to present to a large crowd about <laughs> compost and organic lawn care and I, he put his shirt, new tie-dyed shirt on right then and there in front of the big audience of people and it was a little too tight. <laughs> I originally had figured I would farm until I was about 75 and then quit. But uh, my health gave me out. But uh, we let you know that we were looking for a young couple but it's a more of farm place. We found that young couple. Yeah. My son, who is now 31 years old since high school, has been increasingly uh, interested in running the farm and uh, become, he's now running the farm, I'm basically his assistant and his, his ombudsman when it comes to, uh, let's put this plan in now because it's, I, I can tell by my experience that we need to do something, but yeah, he's, I'm very fortunate. We now have two of our three children in the business. Um, Peter, our oldest son, works with us here on the farm and is developing his own farm and his own operation for selling food quality grains. And Daniel, our younger son, works with me at Lakeview. Uh, and he um, is very interested in taking over that business. Our middle child, our daughter, is a veterinarian, a dairy veterinarian in Vermont. We had to prove something because everyone told us it was not possible to farm organically on a large scale. For our kids and the next generation of organic farmers, they grew up with it. They don't have anything to prove. They're actually, this is normal for them and they're taking it to the next level, developing it, improving it. It's a very different attitude. I want to tell you about a, a, a statement that Samuel Kamen made in, in our soil seminar, actually. Or actually, I think it was in, in The Natural Farmer, he wrote, um, NOFA should have 200 million members. Everyone has to share in the care for the earth and the production of food. We are all members of the soil community. So that's a quote from Samuel, and I think we all believe that. We really believe that. We still do believe it. It's just taking us a lot longer than we expected. Um, but the deep story of NOFA, even though each era has its own, the deep story of NOFA is about how we're working together to create a sustainable and intimate relationship with the land and preserve our community. Um, that's the story. We are thankful for those within the NOFA community who have strived over the last 50 years to create a food system that is healthy for both our planet and its people. This work is being continued by generations which have followed our founders, by such activists as Maddie Kempner, NOFA Vermont Policy Director, Pierre Hahn, Sweet Beet Farm, New Hampshire. Laura Colligan, Dirt Rich Farm, New York. Matt Arricchio, Stepha Rooster Farm, Connecticut. Camille Abdel Nabi, Little River Farm, Rhode Island. Marty Segaberto, NOFA Mass Policy Director. Jeff Niederer, Chickadee Farm, New Jersey. It's up to your generation to write the story of NOFA's next 50 years. We hope it's a good one. We wish you all the luck in the world. <laughs>